So it's really great to be here. I, uh, everybody hear me okay? Okay. So thanks for sitting there listening to me. Um, most of my students would not <laughs> want to do that. So um, today I'm just going to, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to give you kind of an overview of what some of these alter so-called alternative proteins are. Um, I'm not going to delve deeply into things such as the environmental impact of some of these. Truth is, we don't know to a large degree because they haven't been commercialized in mass in a, in, a, in a large enough scale, most of them, for us to really have a, an idea. Um, so I'd like to start out, uh, this, some of the things that I'm going to talk about, we're going to talk about the uh, meat. So because what is meat is becomes a, a fundamental tenet of this uh, discourse. And it's been in the news a lot, and we all have an opinion, and it matters. Right. Um, it's also happening with uh, our, our friends in the dairy industry, for example, with the term milk, term butter, and all those kinds of things that do have definitions. And, you know, we're being faced now with technologies that honestly, 40, 30, 40 years ago would, would have been inconceivable. You could not have conceived uh, how far technological advances have brought us to the point where the regulations begin to look a little obsolete. Um, then I'm going to delve into meat protein alternatives and talk about some of those, give you a quick snapshot of what size of the market, you know, and, uh, and uh, discuss specific ones, the, the, the major ones. And then I'm going to give you my opinions on what are some of the key long-term success factors. I'm not, I'm not here to give you a lot of answers because there are more questions than answers and I think um, we all have questions and, uh, and many of you are, 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 are very well versed in, in this topic, I'm sure, so I'm not, so I'm, to, to many of you I'll be preaching to the choir. But these are just some of the, my perspectives on how I view this um, and what the future might look like as we move forward. Okay. So first of all, uh, there is a definition for meat, and it's right there, and it's, it's defined as the part of the muscle of any cattle, sheep, sheep, swine, or goats, which is skeletal, or which is found in the tongue, diaphragm, heart, or esophagus. So skeletal muscle and mu meat from tongue, diaphragm, heart, or esophagus are considered meat. Um, there's also a definition, I didn't put it here, but there's a definition for poultry meat. So when I talk in this, in this, in this talk, when I talk meat, I'm going to be fundamentally talking about edible tissue of mammalian, avian, and fish species. We're using a broader definition of meat, which down below, the practical definition, is just the edible postmortem component originating from lab animals. But that's just um, a, a quote that I took from a book chapter written by Dr. Bob Kaufman. Kaufman. So this uh, definition does not necessarily say that it has to come from a living animal, and that's kind of been defined. We all know, well, duh, it's obvious, right? I mean, but the way it's written, it could, you know, it could be, it, it could be op open to interpretation given the new technologies that are coming up, that are coming on board today. Back at the end of 2017, um, you see down below, uh, uh, Whitenhall wrote a, a very interesting paper in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, uh, which you can find online. And what they did is, uh, well, it's titled Nutritional and Greenhouse Gas Impacts of Removing Animals from U.S. Agriculture. So they did a study and they said, let's hypothesize. So what happens if we did away with animal agriculture? Gone. So what would happen to greenhouse gas emissions? and what would happen to nutrition, okay? And so they did conclude that greenhouse gas emissions would drop by a certain percent, but equally importantly, they concluded that there would not be, uh, we would have a hard time meeting the nutritional requirements of the U.S. population. For this reason, animal-derived foods, this is for all animal-derived foods, okay, provide 24% of energy for uh, Americans today, 48% of protein, which happens to be high quality, highly bioavailable protein. Okay. 
34 to 60 10 percent of essential amino acids 23 to 100 percent of essential fatty acids depending on the fatty acids for example the fatty acids uh, DHA and EPA pretty much only come from animal sources um, over 50 percent of each of things like calcium B12 and riboflavin and so forth and choline so if you haven't seen this paper I would strongly encourage you to look it up and and read it so that's the contribution so now uh, since we're here to talk about alternatives alternative proteins so this is what, how I define this is my own definition you may have your own but a meat protein alternative I see it as a protein source that attempts to replicate the experience of eating meat in its various forms but without animals right there's also terms that are out there and I'm going to show some slides you know the term substitute versus alternative and if you split hairs there's a distinction between them I'm gonna kinda you know when I talk about the market I'll we'll talk about them kinda together uh, because there are some products that absolutely mean to mimic meat so they the, the idea is for the consumer to eat this burger and you would not know that it's not real meat whereas there are other products out there that are not necessarily going for that consumer they're not necessarily trying to get uh, get you to believe that it's meat but just give you the satisfaction that it's close enough and it doesn't come from animals okay and so because of that there's a whole spectrum regarding you know how companies position themselves and their products there's a whole spectrum there's multiple consumer niches out there um, in this day and age everybody has an opinion and we're all unwielding in our opinion and so that creates a lot of niches you know it's not as easy as as, as meat eaters versus vegetarians or that sort of thing there's a whole there's a very wide spectrum things that will be obvious to you uh, meat protein alternatives are driven by factors such as animal welfare animal rights for some people that's not everybody health and wellness human health and wellness for those who believe that meat is not healthy for you they're looking for that um, vegetarians and vegans as well uh, environmental concerns you know we hear about that a lot these days and so and and uh, and I have to put at the bottom I said and you could add a few and I had to say profit because companies are not altruistic okay if you work for a company your 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 number one job is to help that company turn a profit is it not you know I worked for the, the private sector for 20 years that was my job you know and uh, so none of these companies are necessarily out there to save the world or you know ultimately they want to be able to address these issues or perceived issues but they also want to turn a profit and we cannot forget about that because sometimes that kind of gets lost in the conversation especially when um, you know the, the agriculture animal agriculture industry has been portrayed as the evil ones and the ones that are after profits and all the other ones are just all altruistic they just want what's best for the planet and the environment no every we're all in it to make a profit these like as I mentioned before these factors and you can add a number of others they're not necessarily the same for all people okay there's vegans and there's vegetarians there's a difference between them um, some people are very concerned about environmental um, impact of animal agriculture some people are not um, some people are okay with eating animals as long as we treat them humanely some people are completely opposed to that idea so that like I said creates a whole spectrum of, of, uh, of places where different consumers are at today so various products uh, are currently delivering on these to various various degrees and uh, again many of these products and I gotta run you through a bunch of pictures uh, so you can kind of hopefully appreciate uh, the breadth of this uh, market segment they are targeting different types of consumers they're not all targeting the same consumer some try to target a broader spectrum some are going for a very specific small niche okay 
So some of the alternative protein uh, sources that I'll discuss today, I won't discuss the ones under other. I'm going to focus on plant, fungi, and animal. And, uh, and then uh, some of those other ones are just there. You know, there's a lot of look at algae, microalgae like seaweeds and microalgae like small unicellular eukaryotes and so forth that are being looked at as potentially sources of protein. Okay, and we also can forget. I I, I would say that uh, we there's a couple elements that I see in this. We live in a, in, a in, in in our society. Um, the objective is not to feed the world because we don't generally have hunger, major hunger issues in this country. Uh, but some of these sources can actually be very useful in the developing world to provide protein, not just to make a product to replace animal protein, but just to provide protein for the population. So there's these two different things, so depending on the society that you're coming from. If you're U.S. or Europe, yeah, these are companies that are for profit. They want to be able to, you know, take a share of, of, the, of, the, of the meat market. But when we talk about other parts of the world, it's a whole, it's a different story, different objective. This is some of the stuff that I was able to find and what's the size for this, and they call it the meat substitutes market. And I think they're taking kind of a broad swath of what that means, but a couple of market research firms, um, one estimates that the global market is 3.71 billion in sales. That's really not very large, okay. Um, but the estimated growth rate is seven and a half percent. They're estimating that over the next six or seven years, seven and a half percent per year. So that's a significant growth rate. Um, and the and um, another one is estimating that it will be seven and a half billion dollars by 2020. Uh, most of the growth is coming from products that are wheat-based, mycoprotein, which is fungi protein, or soy-based. In the U.S., uh, it's estimated that, uh, as of a few years ago that it was $553, $550 million, but it's also growing. So it's a small segment, but it's growing very, very steadily. Okay, so the first one, plant protein. This is actually the most mature uh, sub-segment of this category. Um, th these products have been around for a while, many of them, okay? There are some that have been around for 25 years or 30 years, and some that are just, uh, just coming on board now with new innovative ways of doing this. So these are mostly going to be soy-based products for the most part, but you also find products that are based on wheat protein, gluten, pea protein is a popular one now, or combinations of these. So different companies take different approaches. Uh, there have been some recent developments aimed to stimulate uh, to simulate meat more closely um, than the mature products in the category, and you may have heard of some of these. Well, first of all, you, you probably heard, how many of you have heard of the of, uh, Beyond Meat? Yeah, how many have tried it? Somebody out there tried. Somebody here tried it. Does it taste like meat? Is it no? <laughs> and. Uh, but what's unique about this product is that in the past, most of these products were found and still are found in the frozen aisle. You go to Hy-Vee, they're in the frozen aisle. Boca Burger and some of these that I'm going to show. These now, if you go, where do you find Beyond Meat? Beyond Meat is in the meat case. It's refrigerated. So it's, it's not meat, but you know, they persuade grocers that that's kind of where the product belongs because that's what they're trying to replace and so forth. It's refrigerated. Visually, it tends to look a lot more like a patty. Some of the frozen products were never meant to look like a raw patty. They were meant to look like a cooked product. So you stick it in the microwave, in the oven, and what comes out is a product that somehow resembles cooked, a cooked meat product. But this product is meant to now, this, this, this actually looks like a raw ground beef patty. There's another product called Impossible Burger. Impossible Burger uses a very different technology, and uh, so they uh, and, and you find this mostly in restaurants. The Impossible Burger uh, actually uses a hemoglobin uh, um, uh, pigment that they extract from the. It comes from the root of, uh, root of soybean plants, and uh, but because you can't get enough of it, what they've done is they've actually engineered 
uh, they've engineered a yeast to where they've taken the, the, the gene that codes for this protein and they've actually got the yeast to produce this. So they have actually have fermentation vessels that are producing this like hemoglobin. This is a GMO product. And to be fair to this company, they don't hide that fact at all. They're very open about, you know, about, about the fact. So this is one company that GMO, they don't care. They're not trying to go after the non-GMO consumer. They already decided that's not the consumer we want to go for. Many of these other ones do. Some of them care about organic, some do not. So this is a company that's been around for a while. Uh, used to be called Booker Burger. It's part of Kraft Foods. And uh, they're, they're traditional product. Many of you might have had the product. Um, they come up with different products, but they're for the most part they're soy-based product, and the, and the ones that resemble chicken are going to be wheat-based. Okay, uh, because chicken is a blander flavor than beef or pork, and so you know soy is usually going to be a little more strongly flavored. These products are typically found in the frozen aisle. Another one is Morningstar Farms. This company is owned by Kellogg's again. But what I want you to see here is look. These are pictures that I took off the internet. Okay, there were many more. I could have filled six or seven of these slides with just the product portfolio of this one company. So you look at all the different products they're trying to simulate there, uh, barbecue riblets and pot pie and sausage and crumbles and corn dogs. You know, so uh, it's, a, it's a really, really broad, uh, kind of interesting. Uh, Light Life. Light Life is actually it's a company. Uh, their a lot of their products are based on a, a combination of proteins. They use a lot of wheat and soy. Uh, I believe they also use gluten to make the different types of products. But again, look at look at all the the you know the variety of products that they make. This company is owned by Maple Leaf Foods out of Ontario. Another company called Field Roast. Okay. So Field Roast is also owned by Maple Leaf Foods, and their products, uh, you can find these. Um, their products are around here. You can. Their products are based primarily on wheat gluten, okay? So they don't care about gluten-sensitive individuals. That's not, that's not their consumer. So if you look at these products, they're all going to be based on, on wheat gluten. And then there's Beyond Meat. So there's the Beyond Burger. And now they have Beyond Sausage. I have not seen it yet around here. And they have a few other products that they're trying to come up with. Um, these products are going to be, uh, they use a beet protein, is what they're based out of. And they actually use a beet juice to color the, the matrix to make it look like it's a piece of meat that is bleeding, right? Like you got the, you got the red purge on there. I have tried the product. Um, my personal opinion, and I don't want—I don't mean to disparage any of these companies—is that it tastes very much like Boca Burger. I used to work at the Boca Burger business well, a while ago when I worked for Kraft, and uh, and uh, it 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 looks different, but it doesn't taste a whole lot different to me. And I eat a lot of Boca Burgers, believe me. And so, um, but it's in the meat case. It's incredibly expensive too. Okay, it's so those. Do you get like two burger patties? It's like six dollars. Really, really expensive. So you really, really need you, you. You have to be hardcore into eating products like this to pay that price. But people out there are doing it apparently. And then you've all he heard of the Impossible Burger. Everybody heard of the Impossible Burger? Anyone not heard of the Impossible Burger? <laughs> okay, the Impossible Burger is a very interesting product. Um, their main ingredients are wheat protein. They have this leg hemoglobin, which comes from, well, it comes from genetically modified yeast, originally from uh, soybean uh, roots. So they give the, that's how they kind of color it. And presumably, this also helps a little bit of the flavor because now you have kind of a heme protein in there, which is similar to myoglobin that, that's found in meat. And they use coconut as a fat source. Okay. Um, I'll be honest, I have not tried this product yet. I really would like to try it because what I've read are some really good reviews as to how close to meat that, according to many people, they are. And this product has been in the news very, very recently 
because of the Impossible Whopper. You guys heard of the Impossible Whopper? So this is being test marketed in Burger King in the St. Louis area. I'm, I'm about to, I would, I'm thinking of getting in a car and going to St. Louis and trying to think, do I have any friends in St. Louis? I actually do. Go, you know, pretend like I want to go visit them, stay at their house, <laughs> and then go to Burger King and have the Impossible Whopper. I'm, you know, just curious about that. But these things, you know, when they get into this major uh, and quick service restaurants and fast food chains and so forth, uh, it suddenly gives them, this is huge publicity for Impossible Foods. Okay, and if this is successful, you can bet the Burger King is probably going to continue to sell this product and maybe expand it nationally. So, okay. This, this, also this idea of Burger King and some of these chains that traditionally have, you know, served meat products into this is also another, you know, another trend is that, you know, in the, in the meat industry, there are many companies that are invested in this space. Okay, and I'm going to show you that later. I already mentioned uh, Maple Leaf Foods, Cargill, Tyson Foods. You know, these companies are, see themselves as food companies, not just meat companies. And while this is probably going to be a very small segment for a while, um, you know, they want to make sure that they're, that they're in the game and that they're giving the consumers products that, that they want. So that's a, the, my quick overview of plant-based uh, alternative proteins. Mycoprotein. This is primarily a product called corn. The trademark is corn. You can find a high V too. It's actually made from a mold. Uh, it's grown in fermentation vessels, very large 50 meter high fermentation vessels in, in an aqueous environment with a lot of sugar. And uh, you know, they generate all this, uh, this uh, uh, fung fungal material, and then they convert that into different types of products. Uh, they also use a lot of egg whites in their formulations, uh, probably to keep the matrix together. There have been some concerns regarding the sensitivity by some consumers. Apparently, this is not I have not seen any actual confirmation, but s some consumers potentially could be sensitive or allergic to some of these uh, some of these proteins. So. So this one has been a little bit, uh, the company's been criticized a little bit and you know, there's some groups that have gone to the FDA and complained and said this product shouldn't be in the market and so forth, but uh, FDA seems to be okay with it. So, and uh, so this is some of the products that they make, okay? And uh, again, burgers and cocktail sausages and you know, so it's a meat free, uh, proudly meat free, okay? There's a product there that, in my opinion, is mislabeled, the chicken pieces, because if you have chicken, you cannot use the word chicken. So what the other ones do is they kind of go C-H-I-K apostrophe N, chicken. And that you can get away with that, so you tell the consumer, yeah, they do, go look at Burger Burger and Garden, Garden Burger and these people. That's what they do. The consumer understands that it's not real chicken, of course, but it's supposed to be like a chicken nugget or a chicken patty. But I think the use of the word chicken is not legal. That's my opinion. Okay, insect protein. So insect is an interesting one. Uh, it's actually very, very small, but there are a lot of insect farms in this country, even here in Iowa. Um, it's a protein. It's about fifty percent. It depends on the it depends on the on the insect species. Uh, that you're talking about, but they tend to be about 50% protein. And uh, it's estimated there's about 2,000 edible species of insects. Uh, most insects you can actually eat. Um, crickets is one that's become very popular. You can go online, you can go on Amazon and buy cricket flour. It's really expensive. I would love to get cricket. If anyone's in this business, I'd like to talk to you because I would like to um, do a research project making sausage products out of this kind of stuff. It's just, it's just pretty, I think it's interesting. Um, but, uh, you know, this whole concept of entomophagy, which is eating insects, is, has been done in many cultures and it's done in many parts of the world, just not in our culture generally. We're not, we don't see, so we have the, what we call the yuck factor. Ugh, it's a bug. You're not going to eat that bug. But if you go to a lot of other countries, you know, they, they eat insects. And so um, I've eaten dried crickets. And let me tell you, you add spice and salt and stuff, and they're not bad, you know. 
but they're kind of creepy. <laughs> you know, you put that in your mouth, and uh, you know, they're nice and crunchy. So, so, uh, but in other countries, this is really this is a fair. Apparently, it's a. I haven't not seen, and this is the thing. I, I've not seen actual studies, just like we in like in animal agriculture, we're always looking at feed efficiency and all these kinds of things, right, to figure out. Well, to understand our production system, I don't think we're there yet. So, you know, how efficient is it? Apparently, they're very efficient converters of feed. Okay? And uh, so I think this, this is begging for somebody to come in and do a research project because while we may not get over the insect eating part in this country, who knows, for other parts of the world, this is potentially a very important protein source. Okay? So these are some products that you can find. This, uh, I think these products are all from the UK. So this is more developed in the UK than it's here, but I know some people here that are making like snack bars and things like that out of insect protein. So, and here you can see you can get crickets, and, and uh, I like the one on top, right, where you actually see the bug, the crickets, and the mealworms, and all that stuff. Um, but again, fundamentally, there's no difference. You know, why should you? Um, Issue with uh, issue with insect uh, insects are animals. So people who are vegan or people who are like animal rights activists and so forth, they will not eat insects. And many would have us not eat insects, just like they don't want us to eat animals and so other animals. So you know this is not for vegans and not even for vegetarians, but it's an, it's an important alternative uh, alternative source of protein. And there's actually a company, I think uh, Maple Leaf Foods out of Canada has invested in a company called Entomo, which, you know, which does these kinds of things. So again, the large food companies out there and the, and the meat packers, and the, you know, they are, they are slowly investing in, in this whole kind of thing. So that's kind of a change in, in, the, way we, um, in the way we see our business. Okay. The last one I'm going to talk about is the one that uh, occupies most of our time, that's cell cultured meat. Uh, this is actually not a new idea. It was conceived in the 1940s, uh, but it really wasn't brought to fruition until you know uh, technology advanced to the point where in 2013, uh, Dr. Mark Post in the Netherlands launched the first cell culture hamburger at a cost of $325,000, which is $104 million per hundred weight. And like I told somebody, I don't want to be the buyer for that company. I want you to pay for the meat today. Uh, you don't want to know. So, but the costs have come down significantly. Now they're talking about it's about $2,000 per pound. So it's a huge decrease. And it's going to continue to come down. Okay. And this, that's actually a picture of, the, of, the, of that burger patty before they cooked it and ate it in front of the media and all that. Um, the process involves harvesting, proliferating, differentiating muscle satellite cells, and this is a little more detail than you need to know, but the satellite cells are stem cells, so it involves taking a biopsy from an animal. Uh, I, I don't know about you, but I think a biopsy would hurt. And uh, so these are things to consider because this, this is not animal free. It's also not sure how many animals it would require. This is not like you have one calf and that one calf is going to feed the world. It's not the way it works. You're probably going to need to have a herd. We just don't know how big that's going to be. There's so, so many unanswered questions around this technology. Uh, the technical challenges they face, there's a need for fetal calf serum to provide some of the growth factors that these cells need. Fetal calf serum, as the name says, comes from bovine fetuses. And so you need to have a bovine fetus to be able to get this. Uh, another one is if you ever work with cell culture, uh, you know that it's always one, uh, one, uh, one of the uh, biggest challenges is bacterial contamination of your culture medium. And if you get bacteria, bacteria grow so fast. The bacteria will overtake your culture in no time, literally overnight, and it will ruin your, your product. So well, the way these companies have been doing it is they've been adding some hefty amounts of antibiotics. And uh, antibiotics of human medical importance. Okay, so. That is one, but you don't hear a lot of talk about this. Okay, these companies are still in the investing stage, so they're, you know, trying to uh, present the positives rather than the things that are potential issues. But that's a potential issue. And then, can you make this truly mimic a natural muscle tissue? 
like the structure and texture, so the three-dimensional structure of meat. What they've been able to make is those amorphous cells like that kind of resemble like hamburger. But no one, even though there's a company that claims they've done it, but no one's seen it, uh, the, the, the largest, let's call it a steak, if we, that, had, that, that a company claims has been made is a couple millimeters in thickness. So for, are you going to have a cell culture T-bone anytime soon? No. Okay. But they're working on it. So uh, fat, there needs to be adipose tissue as well because that's a major component of the flavor and the mouthfeel of, uh, of meat products. So you need to incorporate adipose tissue, which is not part of the muscle cell per se. Uh, and then color, uh, the myoglobin. So in this system, they, there is no myoglobin. So you need to be able to color it. Maybe they can steal a, a page from Impossible Foods and use leg hemoglobin or something of that sort. Or it's probably no reason that you cannot take a gene that codes for myoglobin and, and put it and modify an organism to express that. Um, and then uh, flavor. There are a lot of flavor precursor molecules also found in meat that may not be here. So these are some of the challenges they face. Uh, the potential, I want to stress potential benefits of this. Number one, environmental. It's claimed that it can reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, it's claimed that it will use, reduce water and land. And uh, overall, it's claimed that the environmental impact will be lower. We don't really know. Uh, there was a study that came out in February where they did four models of uh, growing this, and they essentially said in the short term there would be a reduction in environmental impact, but not in the long term, because there would be significant emissions of CO2. So you would actually take out the methane that's produced by animals, and then you have a, you know you have significant CO2 emissions. But the point is, we understand a lot about the life cycle of animal agriculture. No one's done a life cycle analysis, a life cycle assessment of this, because we don't really know what it's going to look like commercially. Maybe some of these companies know already, and they're not telling us because this is all in their space, right? They're, this is not public. And, uh, but no one really knows as far, you know, no one outside of them, what this is going to look like commercially. So how do we do a life cycle assessment on something that we don't know uh, what it's going to look like? So that paper in uh, February, it's an interesting read as well because they're saying, hey, not so fast. You know, don't, just because we know of the environmental impact of animal agriculture doesn't mean that anything that replaces it is automatically going to be better. At some point, we have to do a life cycle assessment of that too. And uh, product tailoring is, is a benefit that I see probably because you could potentially create products of a specific nutritional profile and certain eating quality, but I think we're years away from doing that. And uh, from a food safety perspective, well, the pathogens that get into our meat products for the most part come from the animals themselves. So they come from the farms and the soil, and the animals bring them into the facilities. So here, there are no animals, so potentially no pathogens. But I say question mark because it's, a, it's such a different system that it's probably going to generate some challenges that we can't even think of right now. But potentially you could do that. Uh, few or no animals, reduced numbers, no need to kill animals, but you still needs animals and you need to biopsy those animals because these cells are not immortal. These cells have a finite lifetime. So you need to continually be taking biopsies unless they can figure out how to make the cells immortal, which I think some people are looking at right now. Um, so using the enzyme telomerase to lengthen the telomeres and so keep the cells kind of going for a long period of time. But as, until that's figured out, you still need animals. It, it can appeal to vegans, vegetarians, or those supposed to be animals food production. And uh, for me, uh, it's a provision of desired raw materials without undesirable underutilized parts. So when you slaughter an animal, there's some parts that command a premium, right? So the ones you want. And then there's others that, oh, well, let me have an export market or something like that. But they're not really what drives the, 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 the economics of the operation. So here you could probably just custom make what you want and not make what you really don't want. So it's a potential benefit way down the road. So. And uh, the regulatory framework on uh, cell culture meat or in vitro meat is, uh, is, is a, is, is been talked about a lot very, very, very recently. It doesn't come from an animal, so in a way it doesn't fall directly under USDA jurisdiction. Uh, so FDA gets involved, but they, they intend to market this product as meat. 
So then it does fall under FTA jurisdiction. So um, first of all, you got to uh, figure out who, it, what can be called, and that's been debated too. And as you know, there are uh, several states that are passing laws defining meat a little more specifically, precisely to make sure that meat comes from live animals. And um, so that's going to continue to be uh, fought. How will it be labeled, right? So, and let's assume, for argument's sake, that they decide that they can use the word meat. Uh, will the consumer be told that it's not from a live animal, that it's the actual artificial, you know, a synthetic type of meat? So, uh, I, I'll give you my opinion. Honestly, I, I am one who is opposed to use the term meat because I think things, words have meaning and standards of identity have meaning. And uh, if you have a product that needs to steal the name from a different product, then there's something wrong with your product. You know, you need to be able to tell the consumer what your product really is and, you know, tell, tell the story and get them to buy into it. That's a fair thing to do, which is the same issue with almond milk and soy milk and all these other things that are playing out in the, in the, in the dairy side of the animal uh, products industry. So, um, so that's still TBD. But in March 7th, so that would have been about a month ago, uh, uh, HHS and USDA uh, signed a formal agreement and they published it and you can find that online. So I'm just going to tell you very briefly what they talked about. So in principle, F they agreed that FDA is going to supervise or they're going to oversight over tissue collection, the cell lines, components, inputs, uh, the cell collection and development, maintenance of these cell banks, and the process of proliferating and differentiating the cells up to the time of harvest. Harvest means when it's ready to be you know, skimmed off these bioreactors in which they're going to be made and then be made into some consumer product. And then USDA takes it right after harvest. So USDA will probably also be in the same facility because this may all probably be, all be in the same facility. USDA will harvest, process, package, or label cells, and they're also going to be involved in the labeling and the pre-approval labels for these products. They're probably going to have to work around specific regs as how this is going to happen, but this is the regulatory um, this is the understanding between the two agencies, how they're going to do that. Um, consumer acceptance uh, is another challenge for cell culture meats. Uh, would it run counter to current or future consumer trends? So, for example, many consumers are looking for natural, fresh, less processed, GMO-free, chemical-free. Uh, it's unclear to me what space this is going to occupy. How do you tell people this is really comes from an enormous bioreactor that, by the way, uses a lot of water. Um, and at least with present technology. And, you know, how is the consumer going to take? Because our, the meat that we produce is natural. This stuff is obviously not natural. So how are they going to play into that? Um, you know, some people will be happy because no animals are involved. So it'll, it'll, help, it, it'll force people, I think, to decide which of these issues are most important to you and which ones are you willing to compromise on. Okay. Uh, will the yuck factor come into play? Can it be priced competitively with other proteins? Uh, as of right now, no, but they're moving in the right direction. These are some of the companies. These are all startups. Most of the startups in this space are either in Silicon Valley, California, okay, or in Israel. And uh, Mosamid is the company that launched. They, you know, they came out of that original uh, patty in uh, in 2013. And so these two companies down below on the, on, the, on the bottom right, Finless and Wild Type, are actually in the seafood space. So they carve their own niche. They're not going to go into red meat. You know, they're going to be like seafood. And uh, so it's pretty interesting. Uh, there's also advocacy groups that are funding some of these companies. You might have heard of the Good Food Institute and another one called New Harvest. So they're, getting on, so they're funding some of these uh, startup companies. Um, and uh, there's investors, and these are some of the individuals and companies that are investing in this, right? So you recognize every one of those, I hope. Uh, PHW, if you don't know, is the largest poultry producer in Europe. So these companies are all in the space on cell culture meat. Okay, they're all invested in it. Um, and, well, I'll make a caveat here. Maple leaf foods is, to my knowledge, not in cell culture meat, but they're in some of the other plant-based proteins that I talk you about. Tyson and Cargill are the primary ones in this country that are that have invested in it. Uh, so just to wrap up, uh, this is my 
opinion on what some, what are some of the key long-term success factors for these technologies, mostly for subculture media because it's a new kid on the block. Insect, we'll see how that develops. Plant-based, that's kind of a more mature category, but there's new technologies, but you know, they, you know, they've been around for a while. Cell culture meat is so new, and it, br it, it brings up a lot of different issues from a regulatory and consumer perspective and so forth. So um, it, it needs to be financially viable, of course. So they need to get that cost down to the point where they can price it accordingly. Where they want to price it, I don't know. Will consumers pay a premium, or do they want to pay the same that they pay for ground beef today? Secondly, they need to deliver a meat-like eating experience for this particular product. Not all the other plant-based necessarily want a meat-like eating experience. Some do, Impossible Foods and uh, Beyond Meat do, but some others, not so much. The appearance, color, texture, mouthfeel, and uh, can they go beyond ground beef, okay? Because a burger is not a steak. And so, now, having said that though, remember that about 50% of all beef in this country goes for ground beef. So the ground beef, uh, the ground beef segment in our industry is very, very large. So that, that right there. But ultimately, they want to go into more value-add products like steaks and chops. Can they deliver nutritional attributes similar to meat or not? Uh, are they going to be able to deliver on the ethical and moral promises? Animal-free? Yeah, they're not yet there yet. I know they're working on it. Non-GMO? Is it healthier? Okay. Um, environmental impact. At some point. There needs to be a demonstration that it's a lower environmental impact, so a life cycle assessment needs to be done of this. Not, not just uh, uh, because what people are being told is to just make the blanket assumption that if it's going to replace animal products, it's got to be better because animal, pro uh, animal agriculture is the worst thing, right? We, we were hearing that today. So that's very faulty logic. They, this needs to be looked at also. I believe, finally, that consumer acceptance is likely to be niche-based. Uh, you're going to have, uh, uh, for all the reasons that I mentioned, uh, and this applies to kind of all these products, not one of these products is going to satisfy every one of these uh, moral and ethical and environmental prerogatives. So most of these products are going to find a niche and they're going to play to that niche. Now the cell culture me people want to cover everything, but uh, you know, if they get there, uh, right now I think they're many years away from doing so. Uh, we were promised a couple years ago that one company promised that they were going to have a product in the market by the end of 2018. Okay, they obviously, That obviously did not happen and I think they're many years away from from doing so because to my knowledge no one's actually, no one's built a plant. This is all happening in small pilot and lab scale settings so no one's actually built a commercial plant to scale this up because they're still figuring out some of these challenges that I mentioned. What do you do about the antibiotics? What do you do? How do you keep it sterile? All those types of things. Okay. So with that, uh, I think we're going to do questions later, right? Yeah? Okay. So thank you very much. I'll be around if you have any questions.